great would you lift your hand and is our God. come on don't let it just be a song Sing with me higher. make it your statement tonight is our God. Lord thank you Jesus all will see how there is great. no name greater how great there is no name greater is our God his name is above cancer his he name is, is above strongholds his name is above difficulty his name is above Lord, depression his name is above diabetes his name is above divorce his name is above death there is no greater name tonight church is our God. hallelujah we came this afternoon we came and prayed at five o'clock we asked the Lord to move in this service I just want him to speak to you how many of you know he can speak without a preaching without if you just close your eyes and lift your hands I believe God will speak to you right now come on when you begin to say there's no name above his name when you begin to exalt his name I believe he'll speak to you right now right where you are Lord open our ears to hear tonight God, give us ears to hear tonight. Give us ears to hear above confusion. Give us ears to hear above difficulty. Give us ears to hear above circumstances tonight. Or there is no name above your name. thank you for this night thank you Lord that there is no greater name than your name Lord when we've run out of words to say in our prayers when we've run out of words to say in our difficulty Lord you said at the mention of your name that there you are right in the middle of our storm in the middle of our difficulty thank you tonight Lord there is no greater name than the name of Jesus thank you Lord hallelujah Hallelujah. There is no greater name. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Aren't you glad in the middle of your difficulty, anybody ever run out of words to say? Prayed all the prayers you can pray? Said all the things that you can say? Reached out to all the resources you can reach out to? (laughs) And sometimes just at a mention of his name, that's all you need. Circumstances start to change. The powerful name of Jesus. Amen. We're so glad that you've come to church on Sunday night. And uh, if you have a Bible, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 27. And I'll get back there here in just a moment. 
Thank you to the choir for leading us tonight, the praise and worship team for leading us. Thank you for, I don't know, there were there was a lot of people at our prayer meeting this afternoon. Thank you for coming early to pray, and I know God will honor that. We will do that every week, every Sunday afternoon at 5. We'll take about 15 minutes to talk about prayer, and then we will do so and then go right into our Sunday night service. So thank you for, uh, for coming to our prayer meeting. On May the 7th and 8th, uh, I've told you, and we've na- announced it several times, our, we will be holding our, our uh, annual district council for the state of Arkansas. We'll be here at our church on, on that uh, Monday and Tuesday. And uh, one thing that we're asking, one thing when, when Brother Moore called and asked me if, uh, if we would host uh, the district council for this year, I was honored to do so. Uh, it's an honor to, to have uh, such an event in your church and in your town. And, uh, but um, the first thing that I thought of when he asked uh, f- uh, if we would host the district council was that uh, what I would want to try to do would be to bring other churches together uh, that, are, that are in this part of the state uh, to serve at that district council uh, in different areas, uh, the ushers, greeters, uh, altar workers, parking lot folks. There'll be, there'll be probably about 1,000 people or more here uh, during the day and at night. And, uh, and then security. Uh, one thing that we're going to do as a church, because uh, I've been going to district councils now for almost 20 years and meetings, and uh, a lot of times when you, if a service goes long, uh, one of those nights or a little long, um, you, everybody tries to get out and you put 1,000 or 1,500 people into restaurants, local restaurants. Um, it just normally doesn't work out real well. Um, and then you go to a town where uh, some, of the, some of the restaurants roll up at, at dark. Um, it makes it even that more difficult uh, to accommodate that many people. And um, so one thing that we have, we have done as a church is our church is going to provide a meal for all of those that are in, in attendance on Monday and Tuesday night. And they'll be able to go to the gym and have fellowship. They won't have to worry about running down to Chili's and standing in line um, um, and, or, or to wherever else they may go. They won't have to worry about that. They can just walk right down to our gym and there will be a meal. But we need, we need volunteers to do that. But the first thing we did, there's some money on the floor right there. You're the only one that can stop your blessing. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, but what we did is we've had a meeting with quite a few of the churches around and, and uh, they're going to participate and, and sending ushers and security folks and so on, which is a great, a great thing. But we're, we're also going to need your help. Um, as a church to be able to feed folks that night and then to serve in different areas. So if you're able to help uh, serve on that night in any capacity, uh, greeter, uh, security, certainly for security, uh, the meal that we're going to do, you could call the church office uh, or stop by the Welcome Center and let someone know that you would be able uh, to do that. We, uh, Pastor Gary, they've asked our choir to sing on Monday night. Uh, with their team, and so we want to fill the choir loft. So please, if you have an opportunity to serve that night or those two nights, and then there's some opportunity during the day as well, uh, we would greatly, greatly appreciate it. It's an honor to be able uh, to host this event and have uh, this many folks that will be here, so we appreciate it. First Samuel chapter 27. How many of you know we're in a difficult time in our world? How many of you know we're living in the last of the last days? Go home and read Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 and it'll tell you exactly where we're at. Tell you what's going on. In fact, if you'll just open the book, the book will tell you where we're at. And, uh, you know, I thought this morning, I was listening to Brother Doug and, and other things running through my mind about sermons and where we were, where we are in the world. And, and uh, I thought, you know, I wonder how many people uh, get their only update a week in church as to what's going on in the world. Uh, folks that don't even know what's going on in the world, what's, what's happening and where we're at and what's about to take place. I just wondered this morning, how many people go to church or sitting on church pews today and just simply don't know where we're at and what's going on? And uh, one thing that I've been talking about over the past several months with our staff at times and then with you at times as well and talked about it with Brother Doug uh, last night is uh, one of the number one problems we're facing in the church, there's a number of things that you face, difficulties you face in these last days. 
But uh, one of the number one problems that we face today is biblical literacy. People don't read the Bible anymore. Um, the only Bible most Christians or most church people hear is the Bible that's read in a church service or the little remind that they get in the morning that will show up on their telephone just so they can say, I read the Bible today. And, um, and uh, listen, if that's you, I'll just go ahead and tell you, you're already in trouble. I'm already preaching to you. The problem today that we have, and I asked Brother Doug, our general superintendent, what's the number one thing that you as the general superintendent of 13,000 churches, 37,000 pastors, what is the number one goal on your list? And he said, biblical literacy. People don't read the Bible anymore. And um, so what I'm going to do is, and it's been on my heart for a while, but um, we're going to start challenging you to read the Bible, not just the remind that shows up on your phone uh, in the morning, but I'm talking about sit down and read the Bible. Pastor, it's boring. I don't like to read. I understand, but here's how you can help yourself do this. You can break it up in three different ways. Read three chapters in the old three in Proverbs and Psalms and Proverbs and three in the new. If you start in Genesis, you're going to get lost in Leviticus. It is true. You're going to get lost in numbers. Some of you don't like math. <laughs> you get lost in numbers. And there's a whole lot of numbers in numbers. And uh, so you get lost. It's okay. Break it up. That's how I read the Bible. I read some in the Old, some in Proverbs and, and Psalms and Proverbs, and then I read some over in the New. It helps me to break it, to, to break it up and continue on. But the deal is here, you got to start somewhere. How are we going to know? How are you going to know what's coming? Well, Pastor, I'm waiting on you to tell me. Well, what if I don't know? Then we're, we're in trouble. So here's one thing that we're going to do. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to give you a Bible. And uh, if you don't have one, Scott Greider helped me this afternoon. And, uh, and thank you for doing so. There's Bibles right below that middle camera. There's a, there's a, there's a, um, a booth or, or something there, but there's, it's got Bibles. And if you don't have a Bible, stop and pick up a Bible. We want to make sure that you have a Bible. If you bring somebody to church or if somebody comes to church and they don't have a Bible, from now on we're going to have Bibles right there at that door. And so there will be no excuse for you not to have a Bible. We're going to give you a Bible to make sure that you have. Is anybody here tonight, you don't have a Bible at all? Raise your hand. You don't have a Bible at all. Raise your hand. Everybody here has got a Bible. Where is it? Hmm. Wow. Wow. I would say that's probably more than most in, in most churches. So my hat's off to you. I understand a lot carry it on their phone, and that's great so long as you use it. But we want to make sure um, that you have a Bible. Tonight I want you to follow along with me in 1 Samuel chapter 27 and verse 1 through 12. And so I have not had a message all week long for tonight. Um, in fact, I went home this afternoon. She said, what are you preaching tonight? I said, I don't know. And so I went and sat down. That's very disturbing for me because I like to know. And uh, so I went and sat on the couches. Everybody was taking a nap. Praise God for naps. And, um, and here's what I came up with. And tonight I want to talk to you from the subject in 1 Samuel chapter 27, verse 1 through 12, when smart people make foolish decisions. I want to talk to you about when smart people make foolish decisions. So listen tonight. Take notes if you have to. Move away from the person you're sitting beside for a distraction if you have to. Have to. Listen to what the Bible says, 1 Samuel chapter 27, verse 1 through 12. But David thought to himself. Underline that if you believe in writing in your Bible. Underline that in your Bible. If you don't, if you think Jesus will get you for writing in your Bible, you don't overwrite your neighbor's Bible. Here's the problem right off the bat. David thought to himself. Goes on to say, one of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing I can do is to escape to the land of the Philistines. In other words, David's saying here, I believe one day that the enemy is going to destroy me, so why not go join the enemy? 
the Philistines are the enemy. David says, I'll just run, be a part of them. The best thing I can do is escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me anywhere in Israel and I will slip out of his hand. So David and the 600 men with him, how many of you know when you walk away from Jesus, you don't always walk away by yourself. You always take somebody with you. When you step out of the will of God, whether, listen, whether you're Samson in the will of God, you've been in church all your life, when you step out of the will of God for your life, it is never intended just for you. You always take somebody with you. In this case, the Bible said David took 600 families, 600 men with him and left and went over to Achish, the son of Maok, the king of Goth. Verse three, David and his men settled in Goth with Achish. Each man and had his family with him. So this is not just 600 men. This is 600 wives and all of their children are there. 600 families. David and his men went to, God, went to Kish. Each man with his family with him and David had his two wives. Lord help him. Ahinoam of Je Jezreel and Abigail of Carmel the widow of Nabal. When Saul was told that David had fled to Goth, he no longer searched for him. Then David said to Achish, if I have found favor in your eyes, let a place be assigned to me in one of the country towns that I may live there. Why should your servant live in the royal city with you? So on that day, Achish gave him Ziklag and it has belonged to the kings of Judah ever since. David lived in Philistine territory a year and four months. Verse eight, now David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites, the Gerites, and the Amalekites, all of the ites. In verse nine, whenever David attacked an area, he did not leave a man or woman alive, but took sheep and cattle, donkeys and camels and clothes. Then he returned to Achish, and when Achish asked, where did you go raiding today? David would say against the Negev of Judah or against the Negev of Jeremiel or against the Negev of the Kenites. He did not leave a man or woman alive and brought to Goth for he thought they might inform on us, they might tell on us and say, this is what David did. And such was his practice as long as he lived in the Philistine country, Achish trusted David and said to himself, he has become so obnoxious to his people, the Israelites, that he will be my servant for life. I want to talk to you about when smart people make foolish decisions. Lord, help us tonight. Help us to hear what you would have to say. Lord, help us in every decision that we have to make. Lord, every thought that comes across our mind. Lord, the plans and goals and dreams that we have. Lord, help us to consider you first in the decisions that we make, Lord, that they may not turn out to be as foolish as the ones that we'll talk about tonight. In Jesus' name, everybody said... So let me, give me a few minutes to, and this may be a two Sunday night deal here, I'm not sure, we'll see. I want you for a moment tonight in understanding the scripture and I hope that you'll go back home and read it because David is a smart man. David is not an ignorant man. David is a good man. David is just a smart man that made foolish decisions. The hand of God is upon David's life. He was the star quarterback. He was the frontline cheerleader. He was, he was the A student. He was, he was the best looking. He was whatever it may be. God had plans for David's life, but foolish decisions caused problems for David and everybody else around David. So I want you tonight, and I'll make a few points with you, but I need to set this entire thing up for you tonight, and I want you to place yourself tonight in David's sandals for just a minute. I want you tonight, over the next few things that I describe about David, I want you to put yourself there in a smart man's place who is about to make some foolish decisions. You were told as a teenager that you were going to be the next king of Israel. David was told very early on that he would be the next king of Israel. 
Samuel, the old man of God came and anointed you for that office. The next thing you know, you are in the royal palace playing and singing for the king. Then like a whirlwind on, on one activity after another taking place in your life that brought you to a place of national prominence. David is out watching the bear and the lion and then all of a sudden David finds himself in a place of national prominence. Everybody knows who David is. Everybody knows about David and his family. He lives in Van Buren. I mean, he lives in... It. <laughs> Everybody knows David's business. Y'all with me? You killed Goliath with a single stone thrown from your sling. You were promoted in the army and made the captain over a thousand men. You married the king's daughter and were best friends with the king's son. It seemed that every event in your life was bringing you ever closer to the day when you would step up and claim the throne of the land as your own. Then things began to happen. Cracks began to appear in the perfectly constructed life you enjoyed so much. There was the white picket fence in front of you and things were going well. Things are happening well. It's, life is going as it ought to be going and no problems. Then all the sudden doors begin to open in your life and temptation comes into your perfectly constructed life that you have enjoyed so much. All the sudden you find yourself in a panic because I should not have done that. I should not have been there. I wish to God I had that day back. I wish to God I had that moment back. If I would to God, I would not do what I just you fell out of favor with the king and even tried to who tried to kill you. Your relationship with your wife came to an end. You could no longer fellowship with Jonathan who was your best friend at the time. Even your best friend has turned their back upon you. You were demoted and lost your position in the army. And the next thing you know, you're a fugitive running for your very life from an insane king who is determined to take your life. How could I wind up in such a place? How could this be happening to me? I remember who I am. Remember who I, where I came from. I was raised at Van Buren First Assembly. I was raised with a praying granny. How in the world have I gotten myself into this place? It's because smart people making foolish decisions along the way. I'll get you there in a minute. Yet even as you run from your enemy, you continue to carry yourself well. You spare, you spare his life when the opportunity to kill him is virtually handed to you. David stood there with Abishai and Abishai with a spear raised said, as Saul was sleeping in the middle of 3,000 men, Abishai said, if you'll just wink at me, David, I'll, I'll make a skewer out of his head. The opportunity to do so is there. You show compassion when dealing with others you could have destroyed out of your own hand. You even continue to seek God's direction for your life, believing that someday his promises for your life will be fulfilled. Then one day something changes. You awake as usual, but somehow the world is different today. For the first time, it looks like God may have forgotten all about you. It looks like your enemies will eventually prevail. You become discouraged, disillusioned, and you find yourself trapped in the pit of hopelessness. While you are there in a state of despair, you make a foolish decision that alters the course of your life and brings you troubles that you could have never imagined and leaves you broken spiritually. 
The enemy has driven you to a place of despair. The enemy has driven you to a place that nobody else wants me. Nobody else cares about me. Does anybody know on the face of the earth where I'm at? Listen, the devil's job is to drive you to a place where you're ready to wave a white flag of surrender to say, I give up. But let me tell you, honey, deep on the inside of you, there's a seed of the Holy Ghost Ghost, that God has a purpose for you. He has a plan for you. You may be in despair tonight, but let me tell you, God is still on the throne. The enemy's driven David to into a place of despair. He now is camping with the enemy. He now has left Israel. He has now left his purpose. And he's over here hiding out with people that he should have never been found with in the very beginning. It's a foolish decision on David's part. That, in a nutshell, is the life of David up to this point. And David was on the fast track to the kingdom. Now he's a fugitive on the run. David's life was destined for greatness. Now, here David, he's a fugitive on the run and he's camping out with the enemy. Our text finds David hunted, hounded, and haunted. David now, the man that was destined for the kingdom. David now, the man that was destined. David now, that was on his way to college. David now, that was on his way to be in the football star. David now, the, the one that was on the way to the top of the class because of some kind of foolish decision has altered the entire, his entire life's purpose and it has altered 600 families around him. Now, because David, I read to you in the scripture just before I started, the problem we have here is that David thought to himself. I'll get to that in just a moment. David decided to give up on God's plan for his life. And I want to say here, I know that every single one of us in this room, we have all made foolish decisions. Anybody would admit that? Anybody's made the wrong decision? Anybody's made a bad decision? Aren't you glad for mercy and grace? I said, aren't you glad for mercy and for grace? I actually ran into someone the other day that does not attend our, in fact, they're not even in our denomination, but they had the conversation with me. Aren't you glad today that we still live under law and mercy and grace? I said, oh, what church are you going to? <laughs> but I'm glad for mercy and grace because if we were law living, there'd be a whole lot of pile of ashes in this room right now. Under the law, if you sped to church tonight, they killed you, graveyard dead, when you broke the law. If you spoke something wrong, if you, if you came against the church, if you did anything wrong, they killed you, grave. Aren't you glad God doesn't turn you into a pile of ashes? David decided that somehow God must have forgotten about him. He decided that God's plan for his life had failed. David took his own life into his own hands and began to live for himself as he wanted to live. I have a few points to make, but listen to this. David has now stepped out of the will of God. Some foolish decisions that he's chosen to do in his life. Oh, I, I can get by with this. Nobody's going to find out. It's just this one time. It's just this one time. It's just this one time of sex. It's just this one time of beer. It's just this one time. It's just this one time. And as soon as you get by that time and you feel comfortable with that time and nothing happened to you that time, it's easier to step on the next time. And when you get past that time, it's easy. Listen, sin always pays off, honey. It may not pay off today. And it may not pay off tomorrow. But it is surely, I said, it is surely going to catch up with you. Am I preaching to a Pentecostal church? It's surely going to catch up with you along the way. I think about this stage of David's life and you see a picture of many believers today. David is a picture of people who had been saved by the grace of God, who began, who began their walk very well, but somewhere along the way, things didn't go as they had envisioned, and they became defeated, disillusioned, and discouraged. 
David probably thought along the way in his life, oh, I'm too anointed to be tempted. I'm too called to be cursed. I'm too, I'm too close to God. I mean, don't you know how long I've been in the church? I'm too this. And all of a sudden Bathsheba shows up. All of a sudden David finds him. This is not the story. This is not where I'm going with David, but it's a good place to stop right here just for a second. All of a sudden David finds himself in a place he should not be with someone he should not be with. And because one lie was told it had to cover up another lie and that lie was told it had to cover up another lie and it had to cover another lie and then all of a sudden now we have a murder. Listen to me. The devil never designed just to crack the door of sin in your life and leave the door just cracked. He never, he never designed, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to teach more maybe tonight than preach. He never designed your life more. He never designed temptation to be a one-time thing. He designed it for that eventually somebody said, well, I, and I had this conversation the other day. Someone said, well, I don't think there's anything wrong with a drink every now and then. Okay, well, if you don't think there's anything wrong with that, what else is okay? If you think that is permissible, then how much pornography is okay? Throw me my phone. How much, how much pornography is okay? I hope it broke. <laughs> if a little drinking, now come on now, I'm going to talk to you for a minute. A little drinking, a little smoke every once in a while is okay. How much pornography is all right to look at? How much sexting is all right? What's sexting? Taking nude pictures of yourself, sending it to somebody else. How much of that's all right? How much gossip's okay? How much homosexuality's all right? How much, how much of that stuff is okay? If a little drinking and everything's all right, how about the pastor cheats around on his wife? What would you do to me? You would slaughter. Some of you sitting in this room, you would love just to have a whiff of that. If that's okay, what else is permissible? Do you think that the devil's job, the devil's idea is a little beer here and a little beer there? You'll be all right. Some of you have drank. Some of you have been alcoholics. I drank. I was backslid. I was not an alcoholic the first drink I took. It's a process. So when you feel good about that and it's okay and you got away with that and nothing happened, then you edge up onto something a little stronger and then you do something a little stronger. Well, nobody caught me this time. Nobody saw it this time. I got it deleted before anybody found out. Well, what about the next time? David finds himself in one step to another, to another, to another, and now he's defeated, disillusioned, and discouraged. In their weakened spiritual condition, people, they, he made a terrible decision. In a weakened spiritual condition, or if there is no spiritual condition at all, there are terrible consequences to the decisions that we have made because David thought to himself. Instead of saying, staying close to the Lord and following his will for our lives or for David's life, they chose, people have chose, David chose to walk away from God and live lives of carnality and compromise. David chose, boy, everybody's quiet tonight. I don't know, maybe I've missed the wrong, maybe I've got the wrong thing. David chose because he thought to himself I'll get to that in a minute, that he thought to himself, 
Now he's living a life of confusion. Now he's living a life of carnality and confusion and compromise. David is having to compromise on things that he believed a long time ago that he stood firm on. But now because he's opened the door to it and he's gotten away with it a few times, now he's walking in carnality and he's compromising. He's compromising back and forth with himself. He thought to himself, okay, if I've got away with that, then I can do this. God didn't get me then. I didn't go to jail then. I'm not in trouble now, so I can get it to compromise. And listen, when we start to compromise, yes, sir. Yes, sir. they made, David made a tragic decision and paid a high price. For the next few minutes, I want to talk about David's life and point out where we go wrong, where David went wrong in the decisions that we make in life and what we can expect when, those, when we make those decisions and how we can pick up the pieces and move on with God. If you are a young person in this room, listen. If you're in the room, period, listen, but you young people, you are facing things today that the rest of us never, ever had to face. We never had to face dealing with this. Yes. Say amen. amen. We never had to face with getting nude pictures on a telephone. You couldn't get one with a phone mounted on the wall that dialed click, 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 click. Now you can access anybody anywhere in the world in seconds. They're facing things and the decisions, listen to me young people, the decisions that you make right now, listen to what I'm telling you. Yes. Yes. The decisions you make right now will affect you the rest of your life. Yes, sir. It will affect you and it will affect your spouse, it will affect your kids, it will affect your grandkids. If you choose to sleep around and all of that, it's gonna follow you the rest of your life. The Bible said the sins of the father will be passed to the children from generation to generation thereof. But the next part of that sentence, sentence says, but the blessing of God shall reign through a thousand generations to those that love and will chase after God. Listen, I understand that it's a little fun to do this and do that, but I'll tell you, you'll never go wrong doing what's right, honey. And that book that you're holding in your hand, it'll give you more pleasure. It'll give you more success. It'll give you more joy than any boy, than any little little girl can ever give you in your life. So, listen, I'll be old fashioned with y'all for a minute, all right? It's not all right, none of you said a word. You'll never, this is what I say to my kids. If I look at them, I'm gonna get the eye roll. You'll never go anywhere or do anything that I've not already been there. Well, I would have thought some parents say amen. The problem is a lot of us try to act as parents too highfalutin and spiritual. Say that. Say that. That we've never done some things. And then we <gasps> are so shocked and taken back. Pull, we gotta pull our heads out of the sand, mom and dad. So what if you're not popular? So what if you don't get in the yearbook? So what if he doesn't give you his jacket to wear? Woo. I'm trying to. So what? You may have something you carry for the rest of your life. trying to 
for the sophisticated people I'm trying to stay, you know. So what? He doesn't give you his jacket. He may give you something you carry the rest of your life. That's right. That's right. That's right. right. So what if she don't? The decisions you make now will affect you later on. David, I bet he could wish he could reel his life back in to say, Ooh, I wish I'd had that day back. Ooh, I'd wish I had that minute back. Some of you uncomfortable, you all right? Number one, I know what time it is, but he let you go early today, so. Number one, the reasons for David's decisions. Let me give it to you. Here's the reason for David's decisions. And the the decisions that he made that were wrong, here's the reason. 1 Samuel chapter 27, verse 1. But David thought to himself. One of these days, this is David, okay? So I'm going to slow down because I'm trying to teach you. I want you to get this. Here's the problem. Everybody do this. Right here. Yes, sir. Yes, this sir. is the thing that yes, defeats sir. me yes, the most. That's this is the thing that stops the blessing of God in my life the most when I start to think. Is God going to heal me? Is he not going to heal me? Does he want me to do this? Does he not want me to do this? Well, he'll let me do this because I'm just sowing my wild oats. He'll let me do this because he knows I'm just growing up. He'll, he'll let me do he'll let me, he'll, he'll, he, it. And it just all, David thought to himself. Here's what he's thinking to himself. Listen, it's right there in front of you in your Bible. He's talking to himself. <clears throat> Instead of talking to God, the one that called him, he's talking to himself. He said to himself, one of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. He's already assumed a defeat. He still continues to talk to himself and said, the best thing I can do is to escape. The best thing I can do here because I can't be like everybody else because I've made these wrong decisions because I have blown it. I'll run and live over here with all the rest of the defeated people. Because I'm not like everybody else, because I have made a mistake, because I did do something wrong, because I'm not rich, because I'm not smart, because I'm not pretty, because I'm not this, I'll just go ahead and give up here and go live with the rest of the defeat. Misery loves company. Victims draw victims. Like, listen, write it down if you're taking notes, like draws like. Like draws like. My mother said for years, watch out what you stir with because eventually it will slosh out on you. What she's saying, eventually you will become what you run around with. David said, because because I'm defeated and I've already decided in my mind I'm defeated, I'm just going to go hang out with defeated people. He's talking to himself. He goes on the next sentence and says, then Saul, he's still talking to himself. He said, then Saul will give up searching for me. Why? Because I'm living over here in the land of the defeated. Why is he going to come looking for me in all the defeated folks? He just stay over there in Israel because he thinks that's where I am because that's where I'm because that's where I'm supposed to be. I know I'm supposed to be in the church. I know I'm not supposed to be fooling around with her. I know I'm not supposed to be doing but because everybody else is doing it I'll just hang out over here with all the folks that are. I know where I'm supposed to be but all the popular folks are over here. I know where I'm supposed to be, but all the pretty folks stay over here. I know what I'm supposed to be. I know this is not right. Ooh, but it sure feels good. I know I shouldn't be talking like this, but oh, wait, just listen, this is a prayer request. I'm not really... 
Just join with me in prayer. Oh, shikamasha, hallelujah, thank you. Just, it's a prayer request. I know we shouldn't be talking like this. I know we shouldn't be, but mm. I've got to be right because I thought to myself. He's still talking to himself. Then Saul will give up looking for me when I'm living over here. He'll give up searching for me anywhere in Israel. And I'll slip right out of his hand because I'm camouflaged by all the other defeated folks. I can still go to church, but I'm camouflaged. I can still show up at the prayer meeting, I'm, but I'm camouflaged. I can still pay my tithes, but I'm camouflaged. I can still go to the altar and cry crocodile tears, but I'm camouflaged. I did go to church Sunday. I was there Sunday night. Did you not see me? Didn't you see me give a dollar? Didn't you see me give? I'm, I'm camouflaged. David is seen in this scripture as having a conversation with himself. Instead of turning to God and listening to the Holy Spirit at a difficult time in his life, he's found listening to his own heart. Listen to what I'm about to say to you. David has turned to himself for counsel. Instead of petitioning the God of Israel that he knew Samuel's been to anoint him. This isn't his first day in church. Are y'all with me? Has anybody ever read this story? This isn't the first day. He's not in the new converts class. He's not joining the church membership. He's not just brand new and started and going to the new members class. He knows. And now he is giving himself counsel. I don't feel like it. I don't think that's right. I don't believe that's the right thing. I don't think that's the right. I don't, I don't. It's a narcissistic spirit. I, I, I. Am I talking to anybody? Instead of turning to God and petitioning the Holy Ghost to trying to find out at this point what the Holy Ghost is saying, David has decided and is counseling himself. David has turned himself into his own counselor and, and the advice he receives from himself is anything but wise. He is trusting in the wrong confident. He is believing the wrong counsel and it's caused him, it has caused him forget to forget the promises that God had made him. When you start talking to yourself, who's gonna talk back? Yourself. You with me? When I'm talking to me, me's gonna talk back. Who's talking back to David? The enemy that's trying to destroy him is talking back to David. So thus David has forgotten the promises of God because David is listening to his own heart. Many times throughout 1 Samuel, uh, the chapter of 1 Samuel, it was confirmed that David would be the king. Yet all these promises were forgotten when David began to listen to his own heart. And because David listened to his own heart, he chose to abandon the path of life God had placed on him years before because he's listening to himself. He decided that he would be better off fleeing to the land of the Philistines and living with the rest of the defeated people where he thought he would be safe from King Saul. Imagine the future of the king of Israel running, running and to the arch enemy of the God of Israel to beg for help. He's asking, asking for a kiss to help him. My God. My God. Let me go back. He's talking to himself. A kiss is the king of the Philistines, where the rest of the defeated David goes to the king and says, Give me a place to live in your own country. Instead of petitioning the God that called him,
Beware, listen, of trusting your own heart. When we consult the heart, we get in touch with our human nature. Our old human nature always looks at things from an earthly level. When David's talking to himself, the first sentence was, he said, I just give up. The first thing the flesh wants to do, I hope I'm helping you, I'm helping me. If I'm helping, that's, that's good if I'm just helping me. The first thing and difficulty that comes that the flesh wants to do is run. I have a, I, I like to scare people. Say amen. I got him before service and he'll scream and he'll run off. He liked to make a new wall in the office door and all I did a while ago earlier is just open the door and walked out and ah! I mean I got him, I didn't even mean to. There's just something about it that's so funny to me. I just, oh it just hurts. I just I have videos on my phone of me scaring my kids. Now they're passing that on. <laughs> they scared Jordan the other night. That two foot child jumped six foot off the ground <laughs> and running the whole time. She's off the ground running, <laughs> trying, to, trying to get away. It's hilarious. Lord, forgive me if, if this is wrong. Forgive me for that. I'm not sure. But I'll tell you what, you find out what's on the inside of somebody when you scare them. <laughs> what you put in there comes out of there. I've not heard anything yet, but ah, out of that one. So I about, about got it all out, I think. It's all. <laughs> the... When you scare someone, or boo, the first thing the flesh wants to do is get away, right? It wants, it wants, it wants to, to run. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21 said, the acts of the flesh are obvious. You want to know if somebody's in the flesh? Here's the list. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord. Jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. You want to know if somebody's living in the flesh? There's the checklist. Witchcraft, I'm not cutting the head off a cat. Witchcraft is rebellion. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go study the list. When people say, listen, I feel in my heart, they are usually headed for trouble. That is why the Bible cautions us to listen to the heart. Let me give you the scripture for it. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it, Jeremiah said. Proverbs 28, verse 26. He who trusts in himself is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom is kept safe. Mark 7, verse 21 through 22. What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside to defile a person. Listen, your heart will lie to you. Oh, follow your heart. The Bible said that your heart is deceitful. 
The flesh is deceitful. The flesh says, tell it, tell it, tell it. The flesh says, just do it, do it. Deal with the consequences later. Whatever you have to do, right now is the moment of pleasure. Right now is the moment of time. Get what you, you deserve this after all. Deal with all of it later on. The heart will lie to you. When someone says to you, just listen to your heart, what they are telling you is a foolish thing. They have given you advice that can lead to spiritual wreck and ruin You are fool if you're foolish enough to follow it. Your heart will trick you and deceive you. It will lie to you and lead you down the wrong path. If you listen to your heart, you'll find yourself where David found himself, out of God's will, out of God's place for your life and out of God's fellowship. If you listen to your heart, you'll find yourself living a life of spiritual compromise and you'll find yourself a backslider on the outs living with the defeated other than living for God. When I listen to my heart, Pastor, isn't that where Jesus lives? Don't mess up here. Heart is talking about flesh. When I listen to what this wants. Come on, this wants a cheeseburger, but you know you can't have it. Come on, I just found out this past week I'm allergic to stuff I've been eating all my life. No wonder I had problems I've been having. <laughs> now I know I can't have it. It's like, I want it. Anybody in this room ever fast? One, two, three. There's our problem right there. Man, when we fast, I don't know how you do it. You do it how you want to do it. But when I fast, I don't, I don't, I don't eat a thing. I can't do it. If, and, and if somebody tells you they fasted 21 days and they didn't get hungry, you're looking at a liar. <laughs> what you're looking at is somebody's been eating a chicken leg around the corner while everybody else was in bed. In the morning, everybody wakes up and you're like, ah, you're full of chicken. Ooh, when I fast, I try to tell my family everything to eat. And I notice everything they don't. You better eat all those French fries. Every one of them. There's starving children in Africa. You better eat all them French fries. And I, your daddy's standing here starving right now. Eat the French fries. Woo, when I fast, I get hungry for stuff I don't even like. <laughs> now I found out I'm allergic to, to tomatoes. <laughs> Come catch me. Woo, that's the most compassion I've heard out of all of them since I've been here. <laughs> God almighty. That's the most compassionate you've been in two years. Over a tomato? Really? After everything else and a tomato got you? God. Two years, all that, and a tomato. We do live in Arkansas. <laughs> we, what if I'd have said watermelon, all y'all would have just fainted right here, right? They told me I was allergic to tomatoes. I have wanted a salted, ice-cold tomato since they told me. Why? Because the flesh wants it. Yes. 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 The flesh wants to gossip. All right. All right now. The flesh wants to hate. You were designed to hate. By the enemy. That's what the enemy wants you to do is to hate. That's why we have so many problems we have in the world today. The flesh wants to do it. When you start to listen to your heart, you're in trouble because of the foolish decision that made everyone whose life David touched, his life that who he touched, his life that touched all of those around, they were affected as well. Number two, real fast, I'll stop here. The results of David's decision. You understand now where David is? 
You understand some of the things that has gone on. I've just tried to explain to you. You understand the reason for his decision. The reason for his decision is because he's talking to himself. He's listening to his heart. He's listening to what the flesh wants to do. Now, number two, we see the results of David's decision. The results of David's decision are found in 1 Samuel chapter 27, verse 2 through 3. The people in David's life were affected. So David and the 600 men with him left and went over to Achish. And now not only is David living over here with the defeated folks of him, with himself, he has brought 600 families with him. Because one man counseled with himself 600 families are out of the will of God and living with the defeated because one man had a conversation with himself. All 600 of his men and their families, his own wives and children, everyone around David was brought down by this one man's decision. All of those people were brought into a place of compromise and temptation because one man listened to his own heart instead of listening to the Lord. Because one man now decided, I am in the right. Everybody else is wrong. All of those fools, look at all those fools. I'm the only one that's right around here. I'm the only one the Lord speaks to. I'm the only one who has enough wisdom. I'm the only one that's smart enough to know better. You just keep listening to him. I know better than anybody else. And 600 people are now living with the defeated because one man said so. You with me? Yes, sir. Romans 14 verse 7. For none of us lives for ourselves alone and none of us dies, none of us dies for ourselves alone. Listen to me, old and young people alike. Everything you do will affect people around you. It's a shame today that it's mostly negative. A pastor has a failure, destroys an entire church. Folks scattered to the four winds because of a failure. One man. Sin, listen to me, sin and open doors in your life, I don't care who you are, is never designed just to affect you. It always, well, if he can get by with it, why can't I? Can I tell you this? I used to own a convenience store in my hometown. I was backslid as I could be at that time. I built my business off of wrongdoing. We lived in a dry county. I sold everything out of my store that you could sell. My lawyer came and bought from me. Folks in town came and bought from me. I wasn't getting in trouble. We all have the same guilt. Even greater than that. And I understand what you're going to think as soon as I say this, but let me finish. T small town. I know everybody. Everybody knows me. It's a town of 10,000. Most everybody's either taught me in school, coached me in ball, or taught me at Sunday school or whatever. I had the church coming and buying from me. Why would I want to go to church when they're all down here doing the same things they just got let out from saying they don't do, but they come off down here at the edge of town and get it from me? And then they'll be teaching Sunday school Sunday. Why do I want to go to church? Now, I understand, but listen, you have to understand the mind of a sinner That's the way the mind of a sinner works. 
You go out to these restaurants, they know what church you go to. You gripe them out for bringing you water instead of tea and then you leave them a quarter laying on the table and then ask them to come to church. If you're going to invite a waitress or somebody out there, you better give them a good tip or please don't tell them you come to, that you go to this church. I give them, I, I always give a good. If, if I walk in a restaurant, you work there, you want to wait on me. Because whether you did good or bad, I'm still going to, I'm going to bless you. I don't know how to finish saying this. Brother Mike, would you come? For none of us lives for ourselves alone and none of us dies for ourselves alone. That means that everything we do in our lives touches those around us. When a husband or a wife steps out of God's will, it affects their marriage. When one or both parents refuse to live by God's standards, it has an effect on their children. You better well bet it's going to affect your children. Just because you talked to yourself and you think you know better and you stepped out, it will always affect your children. Always. I don't know about you, but I can put up with some mediocre preaching. I can put up with some things I don't like. I can put up with some things that I disagree with. You're not going to hear from me. As long as, as we're seeing souls saved and we're growing and we're reaching a community and, and all that, we're almost going to keep moving right along. Because what I need to happen is I need three little girls that don't need to hear me mean mouthing everything that's going on. They don't need to see me running off over here with all the other defeated people. They don't need me to see me here, me hanging out with all that mess. What they need to see me every day is marching right on towards Israel, marching right on towards where God wants me to go. Yeah, I may not like it, but God's still on the throne. Yeah, I may not understand it, but Jesus is alive. Yeah, I may not agree, but I'm moving on. You have like two minutes. And we won't have to do part two. It affected people in David's life. His, de his decision affected the pattern of his life. Not only did David's decision affect the people around him, the very way David lived his life was life altering. It affected the peace of David's life. He's lost his identity. He's now over here just like everybody else. Number three, there was a recovery from David's decision. Aren't you glad God gives you a way out? Here's the good news. Pastor, all oh, that's terrible. All oh, this is bad. This, this is not like a normal Sunday night. Well, nothing around here is normal. Nobody around here is normal. Look at your neighbor. Say, you're not normal. Come on, you've been wanting to tell them a long time. Here's your free shot. Look at the other one. Tell them that one didn't care. Tell the other one, you're just not normal. Aren't you glad that God provides a way out? Aren't you glad when you've completely blown it? Everybody else may make you pay for it. But aren't you glad God provides an instant restitution? 
Aren't you glad his forgiveness? Aren't you glad God doesn't hold a grudge against you? <laughs> oh my God. Aren't you glad every time you walk by God, he didn't go. <laughs> Tried to shake your hand and you get one of them limp wristed. <laughs> shake. There you go. I, I just, you just broke my hand. Aren't you glad God didn't hi-hat you when you walked by? Aren't you glad in, the, in your misery when your mama didn't want you and your daddy didn't want you? Nobody else around wanted you? Aren't you glad God didn't turn his head on you? The recovery from David's decision, 1 Samuel, you find it over five chapters later, two chapters, three chapters, I'm sorry, later. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6 through 8. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. They're mad. Who are we talking about? The 600 families. Now they know this man's been talking to himself. He didn't consider God and what the will of God was. And this man has drug all of us over here with all these folks. We're fixing to kill him graveyard dead. That's what it says. They were going to stone him. They're not smoking. They're going to throw rocks. Each one was bitter. You got 600 mad folks. Woo, two mad folks in a church can cause you a whole lot of problems. This, his whole church is mad. Come on, all 600 are mad. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Verse 7, then David said to Abathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Abathar brought it to him and David inquired of the Lord. Shall I pursue this raiding party? All these folks are coming against me. Shall I pursue them? He's talking to God now. He's no longer talking to himself. He, he figured out that over hanging out over there, me talking to myself, that isn't working. Let's, talk, let's try talking to God here. Shall we pursue the raiding party and will I overtake them? And the Lord said, pursue them. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. That man talked about rescue this morning. These 600 people are needing rescue. And the answer was repentance. Let me go over here. That didn't go well. The answer was repentance. The answer is for David to say, I blew it. Now, God, what do you want? I've been talking to myself. I've been listening to myself. I've been listening to what my flesh wants. It's got me in huge trouble. Now, God, what do you want? And the Lord said, pursue and you shall recover all. Man, I don't know if I was God or you were God. I'd say, now, David, go sit in time out for about, you know, 30 minutes. Let me try to decide what I'm going to do with you. Let me just try to decide what the best course of action is here. No. When David came back and considered what God wanted, immediately God said, here's what I want for your life. You pursue and you shall recover all. He repented. If you go on and read, and I'm going to stop here. If you're going to read on through verse 6 through 8 and read through the rest of chapter 30, you'll see the restoration that happens for David. Here's what I feel in this room tonight. And, you know, I don't know. My job's over now. I'm done. This is where you have to connect with the Holy Ghost. My job's over. Some of you in this room, you have made foolish decisions. You've made foolish decisions sexually. You've made foolish decisions about your money. You've made foolish decisions about a spouse. You've made foolish decisions about boyfriends and girlfriends. You've made foolish decisions. Listen, if you're looking at anybody in this room, we all have. Every one of us have. And just like my father-in-law says, just keep living. Chances are you'll make some more along the way. 
But aren't you glad God provided a way out to come back to him to say, Lord, I'm sorry, I've blown it. I made a mistake. So here's the thing. You know, I don't normally do this on Sunday nights, but I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. My job's over. All I've got to do is just finish this up. But this is where you connect with the Holy Ghost and you've got to be honest with yourself. You don't have to answer. You can go right out and just go right back to what you're doing. And you can still keep taking folks with you. You can still keep living with the defeated. But tonight, this is your opportunity. I didn't have a message. I didn't have a message all week. And you may think you still didn't have one. I don't know. It's up to you. Who would be honest with no one looking around this night? And you'd just be honest and say, Pastor, I've made some foolish decisions along the way and I need to make them right tonight. Would you just lift your hand in any way? Come on. There's one. Come on, I made some foolish decisions. Three people in this room, that's it. Three people. Come on, be honest tonight. Three people made foolish decisions. Pastor, I've made foolish decisions financially. I've made foolish decisions about my children. I've made foolish decisions along the way. Who would be honest and say, Pastor, that's me. I need to make them right. And I don't need this to affect folks around me. I don't need it to affect my family. I don't need it to affect. Thank you. Thank you for being honest. I I don't need my actions to cause pain or discord or dissension for anybody around me. Pastor, that's me. Come on, lift your hand. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for being honest. Thank you. Pastor, I don't want to make foolish decisions. There's some things going on right now that I could go the wrong way. I could go the wrong way. I could go the right way. Pray for me that I make the right decision. Who would that be? Pastor, I'm, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hands all over. Look at me now, and then we're going to pray. We had a prayer meeting a few minutes ago, and here's what I told them when we started the prayer meeting. Prayer, at its least, is a conversation with God. It's what prayer is. It's a conversation, an ongoing conversation with God. A conversation takes two sides. Two people. I'm going to have a conversation with Brother Darren. We're talking. We're having a conversation. David had a conversation with himself. The place of healing in your life and making the right decisions and choices starts with a conversation with God. Lord, help me with my heart. Help me not to listen to what my flesh wants. Help me to not listen to what everybody else says. Help me, Lord, not to listen to what the enemy says. Lord, help me to hear what your voice. You said, Lord, those that are yours would know your voice and a stranger they would not follow. Lord, help me to be sensitive to your voice. Help me to know your voice. Help me to see the enemy coming from far away. Listen, just because you're here tonight and just because you may or may not come to this altar here in just a few minutes does not mean that decision are not going to take place tomorrow you got to make a decision right now and then guess what tomorrow you may have to make 500 decisions between right and wrong Tuesday you may have to make 2500 decisions between right and wrong it doesn't just happen one time every day I have to determine in my heart Lord I'm going to serve you today Lord I may have to do it again at 9 o'clock Lord I'm going to serve you today at lunch I may have to say Lord it's getting a little heavy today but I'm going to serve you today I'm making a choice Lord I got off work it's 5 o'clock I deserve to leave it all there and Lord I need you to help me through the night Lord I'm in bed tonight. I need you to help me in the morning to face it. It may happen every minute of every day, but here's one thing I know. He said he would never leave you. He would never forsake you. And at a mention, at a mention of his name, there he is in the middle of all your problems. But it starts with your acknowledgement. Stay standing up. It starts with your, stand up if you would. It starts with your acknowledgement of, Lord, I need you. So I asked you four or five questions a while ago about your decisions and foolish decisions. There were hands for all, all of those questions. So by your coming, you're not, we're not going to be able to point you out as one of answering one specific question. 
if really everybody in this room would, everybody ought to come to this altar to say, Lord, help me to make the right decisions and choices based upon your word. Why do we have to come to an altar? Well, you can make an altar right there where you are. But there's something about stepping out and moving from where you are to a different place as a commitment around a holy place together to say, Lord, I need your help. So come, if you raised your hand for any of those and you'd say, Lord, I need, I need help. I made bad decisions. I'm in a place where I could make a wrong decision. Lord, I don't need the decisions that I have made to affect my children. God, please let the bad decisions that I have made not be passed on to my children, my grandchildren. Lord, from this day forward, you said those that are yours would know your voice and a stranger they would not follow. I need to hear your voice. You should open your mouth and make that your prayer. Come on, church, would you do that? You can do it right now. If you've made a bad decision, sinfully, you got sin, right there where you are, you can say, Lord, I've made a bad decision. Forgive me for what I've done. If you're seeing repercussions of a decision that's already started, you can say, Lord, help me. Help me, Lord, help me correct all of these things. I ask you to forgive me. Come on, church. Just lift your hands right where you are. Say, Lord, help me. Pastor Gary.